All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is you are joining us from. Welcome, welcome to this event that is run by the Institute for Women in Law in Africa, the very first in the Women Excellence in Law and Leadership series that will be run by the Institute. This session in particular is titled The Power to Pivot, Making the Move from Academia to the Bench. And we will be having discussions with um, women who have moved from the academy and to the bench, understanding what their experiences have been, what their challenges have been with making the transition, and what skills they considered uh, important in making the transition from the academy to the bench. I will be introducing the eminent panel that we will have leading us through the discussion today. But just before I do the introduction, I would like to just uh, mention that you can find out a bit more about what the Institute is doing in this speaker series on their various social media platforms. It will be posted on the chat for you, but you can find the Institute on LinkedIn, Institute for Women in Law in Africa. They're also on Instagram, African Women in Law, on Twitter, at African Women Law, on Facebook, um, Institute for African Women in Law, and their website, www.africanwomeninlaw.com. There is a list of events that they have posted on their website um, um, about the speaker series. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, you're welcome to visit the website um, to find out more about its events. Periodically, we will remind you what uh, social media platforms you can find them on. So as we said, today's session is on pivoting or career change. And whether you're approaching career change from a position of dissatisfaction with your current role, or whether you're approaching it because of a sudden change in world events, like what we had with COVID. And um, as we all know, there has been the great resignation going on. Career change is a difficult thing to go through, however it is you're approaching it. And so today we are going to talk about how do you embrace change in a constantly changing world. Uh, one of the things that we have learned from the late Dr. Miles Monroe is that the only constant in life is change. How do you master the courage to move out of your comfort zone when you have been burnt out by your current role and you would like to venture into a more fulfilling and exciting role? What do we consider to be the necessary mindset and skills that any person looking to make a career change should have? And we will hear from our panelists as to what they consider important. Also, when you're in a, an academic career, what are the peculiar demands of such a career compared to a judicial career now that our panelists have had a chance to serve in both? And how do they feel academics can import skills that they develop in their academic careers into careers on the bench? Finally, how do you prepare yourself to embrace um, the distinct cultures that are present in the academy and compared to the distinct culture and structure that you would find at the bench? And we will have the panelists taking us through that so that we understand what are the important um, skills and mindset that we should have when you're making the, trans the transition. I would like now to introduce the panel that is going to take us um, through the discussion. I will start with um, Professor Justice Akere Dolu um, from Nigeria. She is a judge of the High Court in Nigeria. Um, her academic career began in 2004 and she rose through the ranks to become associate professor at the University of Ibadan in 2015. And in 2017, she became the first female professor of law at Ajay Katha University in Oyo State, as well as its first um, female dean of law. She served as a dean of law at Ajay Katha University between 2016 and 2018. Um, among the um, things that she is credited for is being publisher and editor-in-chief of the Supreme Court Monthly. She was the first female lawyer to publish a monthly law report in Nigeria. She was also the first female professor of law to be appointed to the bench in Nigeria. Thank the you. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. The second panelist that we have today is Dr. Amy Tsanga, um, a judge of the High Court of Zimbabwe. Um, Dr. Tsanga, Justice Tsanga now, is a Zimbabwean lawyer and has been a judge of the High Court since 2013. Before she was appointed to the High Court, she was a senior lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe, where she specialized in family law. One of her students says that you cannot talk about women, law, gender, and education without mentioning Dr. T, as her students affectionately called her. 
Um, she got her PhD from the University of Zimbabwe. And she has also um, received a certificate in law and development for the, from the University of Warwick, as well as a diploma from the University of Oslo and a degree in law from the University of Zimbabwe. She has also been a Fulbright Scholar and a visiting um, scholar under the Fulbright Scholars Occasional Lecturer Program, and has also been Deputy Director of the Southern and Eastern African Regional Center for Women's Law. Um, in 2009, for her contribution to um, legal uh, work, she got the Women's Human Rights Defenders Award. Welcome, Judge Sanga. Thank you. Um, the third panelist we have today is Professor Lillian Ekirikuvinza, who is a judge of the Supreme Court in Uganda. Before joining the judiciary in 2013, Judge Ekiri Kuvinza was a professor of law and the deputy vice chancellor in charge of academic affairs at Makerere University in Uganda. She is the first woman to hold the position of vice chancellor as well as that of deputy vice chancellor in the nearly 100 years that the university has existed. She was also the first female in East Africa to be appointed associate professor of law and subsequently the first female in East Africa to be appointed professor of law. She is a woman of many firsts, both in Uganda and uh, East Africa. She has been, she, ha, uh, she is a commissioner of the International Commission of Jurists and a board member of the African Judge and Jurist Forum. And in 2019, she was also appointed a judge of the Court of Appeal in Seychelles, which is the highest court in that country by the president of Seychelles. Um, she has also um, authored numerous publications and is a trainer of judges in East Africa. Um, welcome, Justice Ekiri Kuvinza. Thank you very much, Luciana. Finally, um, but uh, by no measure um, the least, is uh, Dr. Justice Juliana Masabo, um, who is a judge of the High Court of Tanzania. Before joining the bench in Tanzania, she was a lecturer at the University of Dar es Salaam School of Law which was previously known as the Faculty of Law, where she served between 2006 and January 2019. Her research interests as an academic range from refugee law, migration, citizenship, labor law, and social security. Uh, before joining the, uh, the bench while in the, tradition, in the academy, she also served as associate dean of the University of Dar es Salaam School of Law between 2014 and 2019. Welcome, Justice Masabo. So I'd like us to go into our discussion right away. And for the first part of the discussion, I'll, I'll be inviting um, Justice Akere Dodo to give us her thoughts, um, particularly because she, has, she comes from a very prolific academic career and her work in the academy, as we said, because she was um, the first of, she was the first in many regards, um, has been very impactful. And particularly because of her work in publishing, as I said, she was the first female lawyer to publish a monthly law report on the Supreme Court in Nigeria. She was also the first um, female dean of her university. So Judge, we would like to know, with all of the achievements that you have had in the academy, what is it that inspired you to make a transition to the bench? Yes, so um, I would say that for me, to be a judge was um, it, my, dream from the beginning. So the academia wasn't where I wanted to start off. The position of a judge, um, I think is a public service. And so I had that as my career choice from the beginning and I was working towards it, I was in practice. But then the opportunity came to go into academia because my legal practice was not very challenging at that time. And so I veered off into academics. And um, once I began, I mean, I gave it all I, all I could. I was, so I was making the applications to the bench because I, that was where my passion was. But then I was now in academics and I felt, oh, I have to also do the best where I am. So I pursued the academic career vigorously. And at the same time, I was pursuing the um, process to become a judge because like that was a passion. So um, fortunately, time with time, I didn't know it would take me this long anyway. I thought it would have come in much earlier in my career, but then, I couldn't stop doing what I was doing. So it now happened that I had gotten to the peak before I was appointed a judge. So in my case, it wasn't like um, I went in the academia thinking I would transit. I actually had 
the mind that I wanted to go to the bench from the beginning. So fortunately in Nigeria also, the time eventually came when there was now a path for the academia to go to the bench. That was in 2014. Before then, there was no straight course. So you had to juggle practice and academia at the same time if you wanted to go to the bench. But when the path came, I saw, okay, that's fine. That means um, I happened to be at the right place at the right time and I could give it um, the best shot at that. So it was actually my dream from the beginning, but the academics now helped me to achieve it because being a professor of law, by the time I was applying as a professor, I, had, I seemed to have an edge over those coming in from the academics who had not risen to this um, position. So that was, um, that's for me what it was. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Akere Dolu. I, I will come back to, to that question of fixing your mind on what you want to do and doing what needs to be done to get there. I, I would like to interrogate that a bit more. But uh, allow me to, to usher in um, Judge Sangha at, at this point. Um, Dad Sangha, I'd also like to, to hear what your motivation was for joining the bench, and especially because you had done a lot of work in advocating for women's rights at all levels, um, and you had done a lot of writing as well. So what was your motivation in deciding to join the bench? I think for me, the most um, uh, probably powerful motivator is that I felt I was ready for it at that time. I had been invited to join the bench before, like two times before, 2008 and then like uh, 2005 around there. Uh, but when I was first invited to join the bench, I was still a young academic. So I felt I wasn't quite ready at that point uh, to join the bench. So for me, I think that the, the readiness aspect was vital, that it was something that um, I had an interest, a very strong interest in doing, although one of course, always wonders, oh, okay, am I the right fit, et cetera, et cetera. But coming from a career where, uh, for the most part, I'd been in service provision. When I started off my career, I worked with grassroots communities. So, and then I joined the university in order to reflect more on that. So for me, joining the bench was like um, a different aspect and yet in the same uh, field of providing service. So I was comfortable with it. And it was something that I felt I was ready to do at that time. Okay. In 2013. So, okay. So it, it didn't bear too far off from what you were already doing. Is, is that your assessment of the transition? It wasn't very different from what you were already doing in terms of- No, service. I think it, it, it was different. It was mm -hmm. different, but I think the, the, the underlying goals were similar. I, uh -huh. I saw, and I still see academia as being one side of the coin and being a judge is the other. The two have a way of being different and yet very interrelated. So instead of um, the focus in academia where we uh, find the cases ready-made and we're using those as our foundations for analysis, be it gender or whatever area of the law, I thought it, it was now was now ripe for me to try and look at law from a different perspective uh, mm -hmm. rather than critiquing the law or well even if you're on the bench you're critiquing the law in a different way but uh, I wanted to be part of that uh, judgment making process and I thought okay let me bite the bullet I don't know what I will find on the other side but I was ready for it I think because I had been in academia for for 18 years I'd like to interrogate a bit more this question of feeling ready and I'll come back to, to you in another round. What, what made the difference between the first time you were approached and the time um, that you eventually decided to bite the bullet and, and take the, the academic, sorry, the, the judicial career, but I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, allow me to, to ask um, Justice Kiri Kovinza to also um, give us um, her reflections on this and especially because um, given how high you had risen in the ranks at, at Makerere, which is something that has ha hasn't happened in a hundred years. Your, your career rise in the academy was meteoric in a sense. So what made you, despite climbing this ladder of success in the academic um, um, plane, decide to switch and try a new career? Um, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll start with my, my experience as a teacher of the law. 
I had spent close, I spent close to 18, 19, 20 years as a teaching and research academic at Makere University. And in my very early years as a teacher of the law and its principles, I taught the law the way the majority of my teachers had introduced me to the law. And that was through a literal um, interpretation or a literal approach to reading the law. So I read statutes and accompanying court decisions with little or no reference to the world outside the law. So perhaps at that stage, I had not really reflected much on critiquing the law and asking the question, what is the impact of uh, the law on society? But I think three experiences made me think differently. And what the first experience was really uh, when I facilitated uh, the you know, teaching of uh, gender and human rights to judicial officers in Uganda under the jurisprudence of equality project. I was one of the two pioneer facilitators of this program. And the program was aimed at uh, helping or skilling judges in uh, identifying stereotypes, discrimination, bias against women. And then also skilling them on how to skill judges in crafting effective remedies. Then the second experience was my doctoral studies. I actually focused on uh, the experiences of women in the criminal justice system in Uganda, and I used gender as a tool of analysis. The third experience was when I was invited as a facilitator or teacher on the women's law program at the University of uh, Zimbabwe you know, Center for Women's Law. Now, the thread which ran through all these experiences or programs was that we were expected to interrogate the law within the context in which it is applied. So we really had to interrogate the law within the social, cultural, political, uh, economic context. and. For one reason or the other, these three experiences uh, so, so, sort of yeah, called for examining interaction, yes, between law, legal institutions, and so on, and how it impacts on the vulnerable groups. So for me, then suddenly, or more, perhaps more, more strongly, I realized that the law does not necessarily lead to justice. Law leads to justice if, for example, the judges are aware of the need to mainstream the social cultural context in their making of the law. So after that experience through those three programs, I started teaching the law differently. You know, I acknowledge, yes, that justice will only be truly, truly achieved when judicial officers understand the barriers that people face in their everyday to day search for justice and equality and so forth. So yes, now I started teaching the law differently and asking the question to students, okay, this is what the law is. But is this what the law should be? And so on and so forth. But during that process, I would often be frustrated with uh, court decisions because they were not really leading to justice as such. And then, of course, I started reflecting on the process of judicial review. And I think what was very exciting is when I realized, well, uh, many times the legislature, many times the executive engage in conduct which needs to be restrained. And it's really only the judicial officer. It, it may be in a limited way, but the fact of the matter is that the legislature and the executive cannot determine whether their conduct is constitutional or not. It is really the judge through judicial review 
who can come up and say, you must be restrained. You are actually conducting yourself in ways which go against the constitution, as well as, uh, you know, human rights uh, expectations as such. So for me, I think when I realized very, very, at, you know, strongly that the judge has that responsibility of restraint, then I appreciated the power of the judicial pen. So in a way, just like, uh, for example, Amy has said, I, had, I wanted to go and do it the other way. Yes, I realized that there is power in the judicial pen. If that judicial pen is in the hands of a judge who clearly understands the barriers that people face in their search for justice. So in a way, my move from academia to the bench was rooted in that perhaps excitement or realization. But of course, I must also confess that after some time, after so many years of teaching the law, I became wary of doing the same thing for such a long time. So I became restless. But indeed, I did not move from being exclusively a teaching and a um, research academic into or to the bench. I went through, I became a, yes, a deputy vice chancellor, had a stint at uh, acting vice chancellor. And I think even that experience um, in management of higher education at that level gave me confidence uh, that I can actually be in charge of the space where I am, because I mean, I, I had to be in charge of Senate. And now I could go and be in charge of the court because the, the court, the judge is in charge. Uh, but, but then of course, even with uh, being in management, I became fatigued with uh, what perhaps I would call the dark side of university politics. And certainly it was time for me to move on. So when I was approached to move, I said, yes, I will move. Thank you, thank you, Judge, for your for your candor. I think any of us who has worked in a university is very familiar with the dark side of university politics. Um, so I we 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 can resonate with what you're saying concerning how challenging that can be, um, irrespective of your gender. The politics can be very difficult. Um, Previously, we had um, Justice uh, Masavo who had joined us, but she's having technical challenges. And so we're going to give her a bit more time to see whether she's able to rejoin the conversation, but also to remind the, the participants that if you have a question that you would like to pose to any of the panelists, we will have a Q&A session towards the end. So you're at liberty to pose your question in the Q&A um, chat box. Um, and if you would like it addressed by any particular panelist, please also feel free to indicate who you would like to take your question and we will direct to them appropriately um, towards the end of um, the discussion. Also, just to remind you that this is only the first in a series that, that the Institute is running. There will be other events in the, in the series. And so if you would like to know more about the speaker series and, and the events that will be running in the series, please check out the website of the Institute. I believe the link has been put in the, in the chat for you so that you can find out more about the events in the speaker series and how you can be a part of them. The calendar of events has already been released on the website and you can check that out. Um, judges, I'd like to, to go into um, a second round of questions here. And I, I, I now want to deal with the process of transitioning. So now you've decided you want to make the transition. So how do we, how do we now um, make the transition? I'll start um, here with um, Judge Akere Dolu. Um, you said you always wanted to have a judicial career. You said it took longer than you thought it would take to actually go into a judicial career. But once the opportunity presented itself, and this is something you had always wanted to do, how did you make the transition? What was useful for you in making the transition? The process in Nigeria has um, clear regulations as to what you should do if you want to become a judge. So you express your interest and then ask judges, um, persons who are already judges in the High Court, Court of Appeal, or the Supreme Court to recommend you to the commission who would um, 
um, take the take up the process. So um, what I did actually was to, um, since now I was in the academia, I decided to go through the academic um, pathway because there was now a clear path in the guidelines um, to become a judge that you could come from the bar, from legal practice, you could come from the um, judiciary, quote and unquote, in the sense of that uh, magistracy, become a registrar and grow and become a judge. And then now there was a clear path for academia. So once I saw that, oh, now there's a clear path that I can take as an academic, I decided to work with that. So I um, looked at what are the things needed. And um, like I said to myself at that time, I don't want to have to beg anybody. So it's better I am overqualified. So if I thought, oh, what would they require? Would they require in um, 10, 10 publications? I decided I would stretch myself and do maybe 13. So I looked at the requirements and thought I would prepare to be overqualified. But it didn't, um, notwithstanding that, I realized also that there were, the competition was quite keen. If you're qualified for one position, there are 50 other people who are qualified for that same position and want to apply for that same position of a judge. That's the reality we have in Nigeria. You can have 50 people applying for one position. So it was, it's a very keen position, though the academic one is slim. So at every point in time, I try to ensure that um, I would not, it would not be because I did not reach the benchmark that I wasn't taken. It could be for other considerations, and there are other considerations like geographical spread that will be taken into consideration, but I wanted to be overqualified for the position when it does come. So preparing myself also for that transition. And when I did apply, some of the things I put in my um, applications was, look, I have um, a wide spectrum of, or wide engagement with the legal profession. Like my, when it was mentioned in my profile, I was publishing a law report. You know, so I said, I will put in my um, application, oh, I keep abreast with legal practice by these publications that I have opportunity to um, report on the judgments of the Supreme Court. So I am aware of the status of cases. I'm aware of the status of current decisions at the time. It's like trying to put your best foot forward and say, look, this is the value that I will bring if you appoint me. So I said that I would also put in uh, my CV at that time that, look, notwithstanding that I'm a law teacher, even for law, uh, teaching of the law, you have to stay engaged with practice. So I said, look, I maintain minimal practice. So I go to court. Yes, we cannot appear at the time there was this dispute. I cannot appear and say as a law teacher. But then I go to court. I stay abreast of what is going on with the practice because I'm aware that when I'm going to be interviewed for that position, they are going to ask me procedural questions and I needed to be ready. So I had the, I had the area of legal practice. I stayed in touch with that. I had the um, engagement with the law publications. So, and I had the academia. So it was like on many fronts, I could tell them that I was familiar with the legal profession and I have tested it or done this work in different areas. And I thought I would bring value um, to the courts. And then um, the fact that I'm female, I also did not, um, um, it can be a weapon at times. You know, so um, when, um, I had a judge recommend me. He was also a professor of law. He, had to, he was my supervisor in, during my doctoral um, um, program. He's a professor of law. And he actually told me, I want you to become a professor before you go to the bench. And I was like, not really. But when he was going to recommend me, he said, and he put it in his recommendation that, look, all the professors of law we have had on the bench thus far are men. And that I think she will be a good asset, it will be, I mean, you need to bring gender into it. So in that sense, uh, my gender became a plus. So it was put in the recommendation that, look, you've only had men, so why not try a female professor of law as well? So that's, um, so in transitioning, I was looking all the time, trying to see what are the different areas I can project that I have value, since I'm aware that the competition is quite keen, so that I could ensure that one way or the other, I'll be, um, Nobody could say on merit that um, I should not be considered. So that was those were some of the mindset, or that was the mindset I had trying to transition. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Judge. I, I have, I've heard two things from, from what you've said. Firstly, it was important that you be 
overqualified for the role that you are not going to be denied the role because you were as qualified as someone else. You had to be over and above the par. But I've also heard you talk about the importance of focusing on what your contribution will be when you come to the bench and how you are able to demonstrate the yes. value that you will be bringing when you join the bench. So just deciding this is what I'll bring and just growing that skill before uh, making your application. Thank you, thank you so much, Judge. Allow me to bring in Judge uh, Sangha at this point. Um, Judge Sangha, you have successfully after 18 years managed to make the transition from the academy into the stage, uh, to the, the bench. And for most people, the career transition is um, what one, one author has called, Dr. Dr. Martha Beck has called it the loss in the wood stage. You know you need to make the change. You don't know whether the time is appropriate to make the change. You don't know how to make the change. So in a sense, I'd like to just talk to someone who is thinking about this transition and they feel a bit lost about the transition. You mentioned that it had um, previously, you had previously been approached to make this transition. Why did you think it was the right time to, to make that transition? And also, what did you do to overcome any doubts that you may have had about whether this was the right time to transition? Are you the right place to take up this role? Just walk us back through your thinking process around how you went through the transition and how you overcame any doubts that you may have had. Oh, okay. Um... Yeah, one, once I had decided uh, it was the right time, or rather what made me decide it was the right time. The first time I was approached, it was, as I said, around 2002. I'd only, I joined the university in 1994. So my own career as an academic was still, in my view, still in its infancy. And uh, when, when I look back, I'm glad I made that decision because the exposure that I then got working within a regional context and uh, doing research across African countries, visiting prisons, visiting grassroots communities, really strengthening um, my research skills and also gaining a very grounded perspective of um, how other countries' uh, legal systems work on the continent. That I think uh, was uh, very critical for me. So at the time that I decided I was ready to join, I was taking into account the experience factor in the judiciary and how I thought that I could use that as a judge. Now, in, in terms of then having made that decision and what did I need to do next? Very briefly, I think I was very aware of the fact that I had some strengths, but I also had weaknesses. And for me, the greatest weakness was that I hadn't been working in practice. And so that was uh, uh, a very real fear of uh, making the leap. But then I decided that was not going to hold me back. I decided it, it could be learned. We, I mean, if I had managed to learn it in, in, as a student, I, I was pretty sure I could still learn as an adult, so I wasn't going to let that hold me back. What did I do to prepare myself? Knowing what my weaknesses were, I then decided to focus on those areas where I thought I didn't have strengths. In other words, I familiarized myself with uh, procedural laws. And if it meant buying books, doing research, I did that. It, 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 it was, and it still remains an ongoing process. I don't think one can ever say, oh, I'm now familiar with all the procedures, but I think if you appreciate that you have an area of weakness, then uh, be prepared to work on it. And that's one of the things that I did. But Judge, if I'm hearing you correctly, you think that part of why the transition was easier for you was that you had a growth mindset. You didn't fixate on what you didn't know, you focused on how can I learn what I don't know and become good at it. Well, if you put it that way, I hadn't, uh, I like that uh, phraseology, growth mindset. Yeah, it's probably what I had then because I definitely, I don't want to lie. And I think for most uh, people who haven't been in practice, um, that is always our biggest fear. How do we cope mm -hmm. uh, with making that transition and having to catch up on so many areas of the law? It did mean putting in more extra hours than probably somebody who joined the bench coming from magistracy or coming from private practice. 
But I was prepared to put in the work and I was prepared to learn. And once I got started, I think I quite enjoyed uh, getting to grasp with uh, a field that I had neglected uh, for so many years. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dad Tanga. I see Justice Masabo has uh, been able to join us. Welcome back, uh, Justice Masabo. We are very pleased that you're able to come back on. And uh, because we wanted to hear about your own transition, I I'd like to just walk back the discussion for a moment. And, and Judge Ekiri Kubinza, kindly bear with me just so I bring Justice Masabo up to speed. Um, Judge Masabo, we are trying to understand what your own transition process was like. And firstly, what led you to want to transition? And secondly, what skills did you consider necessary for the transition to the judiciary? Um, thank you very much, uh, Luciana. I'm very glad to finally help, uh, to, to finally be connected. I've been trying quite a lot and uh, well, I'm glad I'm here. Uh, my transition uh, started, it happened in 2019. 27th January 2019. So I have uh, only three years in the bench. My transition, I, I was following uh, Professor uh, Akel Dol, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the name well. Uh, the, the way he Hajane started, mine was a little different because unlike her and maybe some other colleagues, I didn't prepare for this journey. It just came as a surprise in a sense that uh, I've at all the times been, uh, been, uh, been, been teaching and that's where all my efforts were. I wasn't uh, uh, like practicing law in court. I had told myself that I needed to concentrate in academia. And actually by the time I was um, appointed, I was in the list of non-practicing advocates. So when it happened, I was like, wow, am I going to manage this? Because the last time I was in court, I think was uh, in um, 2003. Now you can imagine between 2003 and 2019. But uh, 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 I'm glad um, I was able to, 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 to hit the ground not running Lily, I, I think it was crawling, walking, and I think I'm still in the walking, in the, in the walking part. But um, as, uh, as Judge, uh, uh, as Professor Arello has said, I came with an open mind that uh, because I have not been in the, in the bench and I wasn't practicing. So when I landed on the bench, I was teasing my colleagues that I'm like a, 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 a nursery school, you know, a toddler. In a sense that I was, I was open to learn each and everything from the ABCD. So I learned from the greats, I learned from magistrates, I, I learned from uh, fellow judges, from whoever was around me, provided that uh, they offered something that helped me to to face the challenge and to start my new journey in the bench. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Masabo. Um, what I hear from your story, very similar to, to Judge Sanga, is just the importance of having a mindset of growth that just because I don't know when I start doesn't mean I can't get better as I go along. Uh, and we'll come back to, to that in the, in the final round. Um, your reflections and your advice to anyone who is making the transition. I'd like to invite back um, Judge Ekiri Kupinza. Um, we've heard from the two, uh, the three other judges on the transition and the skills that um, they thought were important in making the transition. I'd like in a bit to just speak about just how hard the transition can be, despite wanting to make the transition, how hard the transition can be. Um, and Dr. Joseph Liu, who is a career relaunch expert, says, while starting over may feel painful, that upfront discomfort is worth it, if eventually paying off into well-being. So I'd like to hear your thoughts around 
What challenges did you encounter in making the transition? And secondly, if you could walk the, the cat back with me for a moment, is there anything you would have done differently to make the transition easier, if at all it wasn't easy for you? Yes, when I moved, you know, when I was preparing to go to the bench, to come onto the bench, one of the things I realized is that there are certain skills which an academic needs, and they are also needed by a judge if you are to succeed or excel. And um, perhaps I could think of three of those uh, skills. You must be an ardent reader, ardent reader. You must be possessed with an analytical mind. And then you must be ready to be continuously updating yourself um, on, uh, you, know, you know, updating yourself of the latest jurisprudence. I mean, whether you're a teacher or a judge, I think you need those three if you are to remain credible. So I, I began from a, a realization that there are certain skills which I'm already um, you know, possessed with. But then I was very aware of the fact that there's a difference between writing an article for publication or a book or a thesis and writing a judgment. So for me, I think that is one of the things which kept on um, you know, running through my mind, how will I write a judgment? Uh, because it's very easy for me to write a judgment as if I'm writing a paper for publication. And I remember, you know, bringing up it up with one of the colleagues who had been at the bench uh, for a long time. And then I was advised that, okay, there are many courses uh, where you can actually go for judgment writing. So I think that was one area where I really wanted to do it right. And indeed, I attended judgment writing uh, sessions uh, several times. And in fact, later on, I became a facilitator on a, of a judgment writing workshops, which I, uh, I really enjoyed doing. However, the other thing which I really thought of, yes, uh, as I said earlier, I thought, well, if I can chair Senate, where there are many professors, uh, many of them men, many of them older than me and so on, perhaps I could control the court. But truth be told, I still was rather nervous. And I remember asking one of my colleagues at the Court of Appeal who was going to handle um, uh, a case where you sit as a single judge. And I told him, Kenneth, I want to come and sit in that session and see how you do it. So I went and sat in and watched. And why did I choose this person? It's because he too was new to the bench, but he had the advantage of having been an advocate. So I did go and sit in, and, and, and it, it was really queer because the question, we even discussed it. Am I going to sit as if I'm a, a member of the public? Where will I sit in court because I'm also a judge? And then he says, no, you just come and sit with me at the, at the bench. I, I, and then I will explain, well, you know, not, not too many, many details, but we'll say, well, she's here or something. I don't even remember what he said. But, but, but so, so those are the things which sort of I went through. But of course, I had the advantage of joining the bench at the Court of Appeal Stroke Constitutional Court. And that's a panel court. So you sit as a panel and it's very easy to learn from others as they do things and you are also one of them. And of course, when you are junior, because I was the most junior, I wasn't going to be head of the panel anyway. So for me, I think that made my transition transition from academia. And I've always told the high court judges that they are my heroes because they go and sit in, you know, even when they like Amy had never been a high court judge, but she sat in there and she managed. So Amy, I think you are one of my heroes because I never had to go through that. But also I think for me, what, then the challenge was, was what I would call uh, a clash of cultures or cultural shock, because I find the judiciary very hierarchical. And yet in the academy, we are, we, we are free spirited. 
And I'll just give you a, 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 a very simple example. When you are critiquing the paper written by another academic, sometimes we are even, um, I, I mean, you say it as it is, you know? Uh, we are bland. It's not that we are rude to each other, but we are bland. And you actually say, I do not agree with the way you define this concept or whatever. When it comes to the judiciary and you are reviewing a judgment written by a judge at the lower court, it is extremely important that you choose your words very carefully. But even when you are um, sitting as a panel, if you want to dissent, you often see words such as, or phrases such as, I respectfully defer from my colleague and so on and so forth. And sometimes it, it, it almost feels like you are being very apologetic. So the, there is a difference in culture. And, and I think, I mean, that's just one example. And there's nothing wrong with that saying respectfully defer. But then I realized quite soon that if I don't, if I don't, if I'm not careful, I'll burn my fingers more times than, more often than I would want to. So there was certainly um, a difference in culture. And then also issues of, uh, you know, when I was in the academia, I was a public intellectual. I even used to write um, articles in the newspapers. And soon I realized that I could no longer do that. But what should I, could I have done differently? In Uganda, when you're an academic, you are allowed to practice as an advocate. And actually, I, I, that is something which I sort of thought of even as I was talking to this colleague of mine who was from practice. And I sort of, I reflected and I said, well, maybe a stint at the bar would have helped. But having said that, I think, yeah, it was worth uh, leaving my comfort zone to learn new skills, although the skills are really very, very interrelated. And of course, the research experience helped me interrogate the law better than I would have done had I not been a scholar and therefore, of course, a, a researcher. Because I know when I went for interview to join the Court of Appeal, one of the questions that was asked by, I mean, by a member of the of parliament, because you have to go through parliament, you go, you know, through parliament before uh, eventually being appointed. He asked me, you've never practiced law. So what makes you think? And you know, parliamentarians can be, you know, intimidating if you're not careful. What makes you think you can make a, a judge? Why don't you go and start at the high court? And then I just reminded him very, very politely that our constitution talks about a jurist joining the bench at the level of court of appeal, constitutional court. And I had to explain to him that a jurist is actually a renowned scholar. And I have experience, I mean, I, I've widely published. So yeah. So that, that's what I think I could have done, perhaps, as stint at the bar. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Ekele Kovinda. Um, I know we are now coming to the end of the session, and I've seen there is a comment um, on the chat box um, of Lady Tina um, from Nigeria associating herself with what Dr. Amy said about the, the challenges of um, not having practiced as um, a, a practitioner before joining the bench and just uh, appreciating the candor around your chal the challenges you experienced. There is a question that has been posed and, and I'd invite the panelists to just reflect on this as they give us their closing remarks. Um, someone is asking about the judges who continue to teach at the universities and whether there are any ethical questions that arise where you remain on the bench, but you are also teaching. Um, so one of the things I'd like you to just um, speak to as you give your concluding remarks is what ethical issues might you um, foresee if someone is doing work outside of the bench like teaching and remaining on the bench but this last session in particular I'd like reflections on 
that's just what you would tell someone else who's trying to make the transition or is considering the transition. Um, what advice would you give them around the tradition, uh, the, the transition? What do you wish someone had told you as you are making the transition that you would like to tell someone else who's making the transition? Uh, I'd like us to start with uh, Justice Sanga, if it's okay. And then I'll take Justice Akere Tolu, um, Justice Masabo, finally Justice um, Ukiri Kubinga. Uh, thank you. What do I wish uh, someone had told me? Uh, that my weekends would never be the same. I mean, someone was asking me, what do you do in your spare time? I write judgments. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of work. Uh, I'm not saying uh, academics don't work. They work equally hard. But there's just no respite. When you're dealing with people's cases, you also have to bear in mind that you can't sit on judgments. Uh, for too long. Uh, so you are constantly on the roll. And yes, it can become um, extremely uh, draining. So we do, I, I think it's the same in a lot of other jurisdictions. We do take a break after uh, a judicial term and that gives you time to uh, sort of re rewire and regain your energy. But yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of judges, not just from academia, but even those from practice, I think the shock that we all experienced was uh, the magnitude of the demand on one's time. Thank you, Judge Tsanga. Um, Judge Akere Dolu. So I would say that um, in terms of transitioning, I'm still in transition because I just got appointed. Um, 30th of September, so I'm still about six months old as a judge, so I'm still just transiting. Um, and uh, before I ask, answer the question about what to, uh, I should tell somebody, maybe I'll just keep this in about um, the culture of peer review. You know, that's peculiar to us as academics. So I find that, that it is still available and can be um, taking advantage of in the judicial as a as a uh, judicial officer, you know whether from the cases or from in person. And um, um, Judge Lillian said about um, speaking with her colleagues and trying to sit. I had to do that. It wasn't provided, but I took it upon myself to sit with um, another judge before I started. And then I read record books of people judges who had sat before. I went behind and read the record books to know how do they record because in Nigeria we still have to record in um, longhand in writing what goes on in court. So I had to look at past records and say, oh, this is how it is done and then go ahead to do it. Then um, in terms of what I would, I wish I had known before now what, what somebody had told me concerning the transition is about um, maintaining your relationships. You know, maintaining your relationships in the different sectors. I think that's quite important in transitioning that you know, um, the legal circles, not just in your field. I find that academic people, we tend to just stay within ourselves. No, we should stretch out and actually network across board. Even if you're not in practice, maintain your relationship with the local bar association so that you have people, when they talk about you, many times you are not in the room. So if where the equities are equal, somebody has to say something, then you have somebody who can say, oh, I know her. She's not in practice, but she's a bad person. You know, so they're able to, I would suggest that you take, um, maintain an active role in the bar so that you can have, because going into the bench, it's full of practitioners, not many academia. So the, but the people on the bench, the people at the bar need to know you, need to know who you are, need to know where you stand, need to know about your ethics, need to know about your thoughts about issues so that if the time comes, um, they can actually speak for you. And um, if I can just add this one thing that as a woman, that's an additional one balancing all the roles you learn, need to learn to say no to some things and just so you have some time for yourself and for your family at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Akere Dolu. Um, uh, Judge Masabo, I don't know whether you're able to come on now. Luciana, I am back. Yes, I think what I, would, uh, what I would advise is that uh, a person considering a career as a judge I think you should first know that uh, this is a career that brings a unique experience, a, a unique experience. 
It is both exciting on the one hand, but as colleagues have said, it is very, it is very stressful. Exciting in a sense that um, you have this rare opportunity of making direct impact to people's lives. And not only to lives of those litigants that come before you, but um, you, 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 you make an impact on the people around them, but also the community as a whole. And the amount of work, now that's the stressful part, that uh, as, as, as my colleague has just said, it is not that uh, in academia you have, um, you do not work, you work, but the kind of work, the amount of work that is required for a judge, it's more than what you probably have in academia and probably in other, in other, in other, in other career. You carry your files everywhere, every place. And I think uh, it is also important to know and to learn the skills to balance because the cases that we decide, the files that we decide, that, that come through our tables, through our hands and eyes. They come with these peculiar issues that in one way or the other, if you are not careful and you do not strive to balance maintain, by maintaining um, your cycles and network, you may find yourself that uh, you have been um, psychologically affected. You imagine in a day, for example, I'll, I'll give an example today I was handling um, I have a criminal session, and all of these cases, most of them, is intimate partner, uh, 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 intimate partner, killing or violence or something. So, if you are, these are cases and many others, of course, that they are likely to affect you as a person. So, I think it's very important that a person considering to to join the bench should be told about this. And there should always be intervention, I think, to make sure that we remain on the balance. Otherwise, it could be quite, um, it could be quite uh, serious and damaging on, uh, on, on, on individuals. And the other thing that I would want to say, and I think now I'll chip in, I'll chip, chip on on the question that was asked as to whether it is good or bad to maintain uh, to, to continue with the teaching while you are in the bench. Personally, I do not see a problem about that, but uh, the main problem would be, for example, I sit in the court as a high court judge. Mm -hmm. Now, if I go to classrooms, basically, I would, be, I would have an opportunity of interrogating the judgments. Mm -hmm. Now, there is this danger of finding yourself uh, 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 um, uh, on finding yourself on, on finding yourself acting how should I put it as a Supreme Court would not have a Supreme Court in Tanzania the highest court is a court of appeal so when interrogating the decisions of the court of appeal then which is the highest court in the hierarchy I think you can if not if not, if not careful, if, if, if you're not careful, it's, there is a very high possibility that you may find yourself stepping out of the border and, and, um, and, and giving comments that may be the innocently made, but they could be understood otherwise by the students or to whoever that they are presented. So while it is good, I think, but, um, but, 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 but I think, that also issues. But the, the second thing that I would consider before I continue with the teaching is how do I, how do I balance? How do I conduct myself? And what are the limits that I have to put so that I do not put the independence of the judiciary at stake? How will I be able to, to make sure that I teach, but at the same time, I do not. Um, I do not. I, I, I do not create a situation where uh, the judiciary could be or could be seen as as um, as encroaching in other in other in other in other organs of the state. Because I can be speaking as Juliana, lecturing in a classroom, but uh, someone else, all my audience, they would take it as a judge. 
Now, if they take it as a judge, there is also a possibility that the entire judiciary can easily be dragged in something that uh, 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 it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't know, or even it doesn't have an, a, a similar opinion. So those would be my 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 considerations. Thank you, thank you, Judge Masabo. We are glad you were able to rejoin the meeting. Um, finally, I'd like us to give uh, Judge Ikiri Kubinza a chance to give us her closing remarks. Um, thank you very much. I think again, I will talk about the cultural shock. As far as I'm concerned. Um, the judiciary is a subculture of its own, even within the wider legal fraternity. And if somebody uh, moves from wherever they are coming from onto the bench, um, after having given thorough thought to it, I think it would be helpful for that person to get a mentor within the judiciary to just know the inside story. Uh, because you can easily burn your fingers and then have restless nights. I think for me, that would be how to do it. If you really plan ahead of time to be a Lord Denning, then you had better um, have a mentor to take you through what to expect at any particular time. Thank you so, so much. And allow me to just appreciate all the panelists for being so candid in their reflections today. I have seen comments in the chat indicating that what they got from this session is much more than they anticipated coming in. And so I'd like to thank each of you, Judge Ekiri Kubinza, Judge Sanga, Judge Akere Dolu, and Judge Matsabo for making time to join this discussion today. Just to remind the participants that this is only the first in a series that is being run by the Institute. And there will be other events in the series and you can access the full list of events which are coming up on their website. The link has been put in the chat, but in case you want to get uh, more information, kindly go ahead um, and also just check out the website, Institute for Women in Law, for African Women in Law. Also check their socials, um, um, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you're able to get more information about upcoming events. Allow me to also thank GIZ for their support towards this event. It would not have been possible without their partnership. And my concluding thoughts uh, on today's session will be actually a quote that I saw from Francis Porter. And it says, the key to successful career transition is realizing you don't have to do it alone. Ask for help, buddy up or create a support network with peers or friends in a similar situation motivate, encourage, be constructive, and hold each other accountable. You will be surprised at how quickly you will move forward when you have others with you on the journey. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to bring this session to a close. Thank you so much for your patience, even as we overshot the time. We look forward to seeing you in more sessions which are run by the Institute for um, African Women in Law. Thank you very much. Have a good um, morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you.